all that you're going to do. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. And we are going to continue this morning on our series, Memorial Stones. We're learning lessons from our history and uh, giving you an idea of where we come from as a church and our fellowship. And then we're learning lessons Along the way, and the point of this is if we know clearly where we come from, then we can look back to make sure that we are lined up and still doing the right thing. Let's get our main verse, Joshua uh, 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of, of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut <coughs> off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, and this is where the uh, title of our series go, uh, comes from memorial stones and he said that is so in later times you can look back and remember what God has done so let's look we're going to begin this morning we're going to talk about the power of commitment because we're looking at what makes our church and our fellowship uh, strong or or unique and we're going to talk about the power of commitment one of the common problems in in uh, many churches as a whole is uncommitted people in modern Christianity, this would be especially true in America, but I'm sure it's all over the world, is you have people, they approach church as consumers in the exact same way that they would choose a restaurant or a store or a business. You have people, they are Christians. What church am I going to go to? I'm going to shop. And I'm going to compare benefits. What is the children's program at your church like? Does your church have live camels for the Christmas production? Uh, Easter, this church, they have helicopter rides for kids. What does your church... We just shop. It's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis. And they are consumers. It has to do with what I can get from uh, a church. And so if people come to a church as a consumer, what it tends to produce is a lack of faithfulness. You have people, they are not committed to that church because they feel no obligation. They didn't choose it uh, for any other reason than simply, it's, it was good for me. I like the program or the music or the preaching or whatever it might be. So what happens in many churches and I'm speaking as a whole, not in our fellowship, is you have people that they attend church whenever they feel like it. A common thing would be people who come once a week, if that, and uh, they are simply coming when they feel like it. You, you can do your own research. There are hundreds of churches in the tri or quad city areas here. Uh, many years ago, I think I... There was 323 churches back then. There probably are more now. And I challenge you, not many churches even have Sunday night services. So they have a Sunday morning service and that's it. And there are very few churches that have midweek services uh, at all. And that's just because the people are approaching it as consumers. I have no obligation to come. I'll come if the weather is decent, there's nothing good on TV, no one's visiting me, I'm not tired, then I'll, I'll go to church. We have, uh, in our history, had a, a funny story that uh, Beth Cassio reminded me of. In, uh, we were originally part of a denomination called Foursquare. Foursquare, they have their conventions, that would be our equivalent of conference, operates a little differently than ours. Ours Every six months, conference is here in Foursquare, they rotate. And it often is whoever is growing, uh, then we'll have the, uh, the annual convention there. One time in our history, after our church was growing, 
they actually had a Foursquare convention. It wasn't our conference. This was a Foursquare convention, and they held it in Prescott. And uh, this was the first time that uh, that had ever happened. And uh, uh, Beth said she was helping Rochelle Malinowski, who was in charge of the kitchen. And so they were trying to work out, of course, hundreds of people came to convention or the service at night. And then they're going to have morning seminars, not quite like ours. It often was elective, which ones you want to go to multiple at the same time. But the uh, idea, they were trying to work out how many donuts should we order for the morning? And their only reference point was our conference, the people who are there at night, basically most of them come in the morning. So they ordered the donuts based on how many were there at night and what happens in our conference. And she said the next morning there were 50 people at conference. Where is everybody? They went sightseeing. They decided to go see the Grand Canyon. That's a little different than we operate. <laughs> it probably would be a problem if we showed up and only 50 people came for morning uh, services. So I'm, my, my point is they felt no obligation to uh, come. Our church, the Prescott Church, is a very committed church. Commitment or committed means loyal and willing to give your time and energy to something you believe in. So one of the marks of our church and then over time of our fellowship has to do with commitment. That, of course, started with my parents. My parents, they didn't play at serving God. They didn't play at, it was not a part-time or an occasional thing. They were absolutely committed. And so that spirit, of course, was transmitted. But our church, when my parents came, revival broke out. Our church was birthed in revival is the Spirit of God moving in the Jesus movement all across America. We had raw sinners. Our church was not built on, let's clean out the Assembly of God and the Church of Christ and whoever and come to our... The majority of the people that were coming were raw sinners that were saved. They were powerfully converted. Statistically, the ratio of... Uh, sinners who got saved and converted and came versus church people that started attending, the majority of people, they were converts. And how many of you know when someone, when they get genuinely and powerfully converted, they are more naturally committed. A convert who has an experience with Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost, they want more of God, not less. They're not trying to work out what's the least amount of services I can come to and still be saved. A real convert wants more of God. They want more of church. In the early days of the revival that broke out in our church, it was not uncommon that our revivals would wind up lasting two weeks because of what God's doing. We actually have a, this is an ad from the paper of an original flyer. Larry Reed held over for a second week. So we'd already had a full week of revival, but so many people were getting saved. God was doing so much, we went for a second week. And that was, that was very common. I'm, I'm not, if evangelists are watching this, if you, the, the point is not every revival of you, if it goes two weeks, you will have a move of God. This is in response to what God was doing. And that was most of the people who came to re revival would have come to all the services just because of what God was doing. So in an atmosphere of revival, commitment, it often is automatic. It just happens. But a very significant decision that Pastor Mitchell made in the beginning of our church was starting the concert ministry. I told in previous lessons that we had young hippies that got saved, that they were uh, musical, had been involved in bands. Ron Burrow was uh, involved in a secular band before Salvation uh, Eden. And then we have uh, a picture of, of the band here. This is uh, uh, them playing at the Vine in, in uh, La Habra, uh, California. And so I told how 
because they were musical, people were inviting them, go here, come there, wanting them to be away a lot. And so they did go on a tour and were away from church. And so my dad wanted to start a regular, what they called coffee house. It was just a precursor to the concert ministry that we have. He said, we will invest money in it, but a very significant decision, he made them make a commitment. We will only rent a building, we're only gonna buy equipment, do that if you are going to commit. We cannot have a concert ministry if you're gonna come when you feel like it. And they agreed, the band Eden made a commitment. We will be there, a girls group, Living Water, some others that were starting to rise up, they made a commitment, we will be loyal we're going to be there every time the doors are open. And then we have a picture, another picture of Eden. And there are two more. This is now in one of the, uh, I don't remember, this was the very first concert building we had, or maybe the second one. But they did. Eden made a commitment. And for the next two years, they played two sets a night, Friday and Saturday night. And they were there every week until Ron Burrow uh, Ron and Susie were sent out as our first church. They made a commitment. So commitment's logical. My dad made them make a commitment because you can't have a ministry if the people aren't going to be there. Right? I've pastored. I've had talented people. I, I want to play, but the problem is we don't know if you're going to show up. That, that just won't work. How can we have a ministry if we don't know you're going to be there? Out of that we then began requiring commitment. People, I want to be in ministry, okay, but faithfulness is absolutely the foundation of being involved in public ministry. And we, this is non-negotiable. If you're going to be in ministry, number one, you're going to be faithful. You're going to be in all the services. Uh, number two is we want people to pray. You know, at the least, that would be before the event, and it would be helpful if they're involved in prayer and other times. And thirdly, we want people to tithe, because people who don't tithe, there's something wrong in their heart, and we don't want you, if you're a non-tither, to be transmitting your spirit uh, into our church. So we required that. We require commitment. That is, first of all, for exampleship. When new converts get saved, they learn what a Christian is, not simply from the preaching or reading their Bible, they learn by looking at other believers. I don't know about you, but when I was a young convert, young disciple, I learned to pray. I didn't really know what to say, but I went to prayer meetings and I listened. Other people, they said, I said that's good. I'm writing that one down. I went witnessing with other people. Kind of, I didn't contribute much. I just like... Yeah, that's true. I learned by exampleship, then every new person, they get an idea of what a Christian uh, is. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Okay, this is a biblical thing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I know that, but often Paul could, he could say, listen, I am following Christ. If you'll follow my example, you will see Christ. I don't want to be Christ, but I can show you Christ. I set an example, and that is what we want from people in ministry. Set an example. Number two, it is for a spiritual dimension. Ministry. Listen, I don't care how talented you are. I want to know your spirit. That's one of the common things. New people come to, I want to be involved in ministry. We want to watch you. We want to see your spirit. I know you're smiling today, but we want to get to know you. And so the reason why is we believe that ministry is not just singing, acting, you know, name a ministry, whatever it is. Every part of ministry is transmitting or carrying the spirit of God. 2 Corinthians 4.7. We have this treasure from God, but we are like clay jars that hold the treasure. This shows that the great power is from God, not from us. Okay, that's a fascinating scripture. This is ministry. What ministry are you involved in? The Bible says the presence of God. How does the presence of God get to 
visitors, sinners, new converts. How does it get there? It comes through you. You carry God wherever you go. That is why you need to set an example. You need to be faithful. You need to tithe because what you are doing is not just hitting nice notes or hot licks or acting in your funny or your grit. No, what you're doing is you are carrying the presence of God. And so that is why we say we want people to be committed. So that started just with ministry. But then as the plan of God, the vision unfolded, God revealed to Pastor Mitchell his plan of discipleship. Training couples to be, uh, fulfill their calling in God, to ultimately to preach the gospel. And I tell you, commitment is the absolute foundation of discipleship. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that you have heard from us, from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, this is a discipleship scripture. He says, okay, the things you know and understand about God and his will, he says you commit it not to guys who ask, not to talented. He says you find faithful because that is the foundation. You cannot be used of God if you are not faithful. Faithful is reliable you can count on it right you want to make sure every time you go to the refrigerator it's still cold you don't want your refrigerator to say i'm taking a day off right you want it to be faithful disciples can only be made in an atmosphere of faithfulness and commitment you want to be used by god faithfulness disciplines your flesh there's something powerful about get out of bed in the morning. I want to be used of God. How about you shake the sheets and get out of bed in the morning and pray? Come to church when you don't really feel like it. I, I'm just feeling down today. So what? Other people need you. That, that's a powerful discipline. It, it disciplines selfishness. It disciplines laziness. And what that means if you are faithful, you are choosing what's best for others, not yourself. A consumer mentality is, what's good for me? And the moment another church has a better production, I see your live camels and your helicopter rides, we will give a, we'll top that, then we move along. But faithfulness is, I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it to set, I want a new convert when they come to see me in church, in prayer, doing the right thing. Okay, I wanna say something very important, listen to me. Discipleship is an atmosphere. Atmosphere is prevailing climate. We do not grow bananas in Prescott, right? The climate is not correct. You grow them in tropical areas. Disciples have to be grown in a climate of discipleship. It is an atmosphere. It's a culture. And I want to say something. Every single person in church contributes to the atmosphere of disciples. Some of you are not called to preach. You will never be on stage. You'll never have a microphone. I don't care. You are supplying something that enables other people to fulfill the will of God. That's the foundation of our church. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Now in the church, there was at Antioch, there was a certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, called, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Serene, Menina, and then brought them out from Herod, the, the, the Tetriarch, and Saul. And as they ministered the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. Then they fasted and prayed and laid hands on them and sent them away. Okay, look at verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord in fasting and prayer. Who is they? It's verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch. 
So in other words, everybody in church contributed to this atmosphere. They apparently, I don't know if it was a pre-conference three-day fast, but they were praying and laying hold of God. It created a supernatural dimension in which God could speak to some. Not everyone's supposed to preach, but some heard from God and they entered their calling. Discipleship is not the disciples at a higher level and everybody else is peasants. No, no, no. Listen to me, every single one of you, I don't care, every single one of you, you contribute, it matters. If you're ever thinking, does it matter if I go to church today? It absolutely does. Tonight, we're gonna have prayer before church. Does it matter if you pray? Absolutely. Discipleship is not just the people being discipled and the pastors, it's the people. And this is what we believe. We have a very committed congregation because all of us together, we are raising up disciples to reach the world. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 20. But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. Okay, that is why you should come to church, you should pray, because the Bible says you have some members, they may be called to ultimately be pastors, but the Bible says we do it all together. We're all the body. And that becomes when you have committed people who understand what is your role in the kingdom of God, I am helping create a climate where disciples can be called and launched into the ministry. You may never go, but you are absolutely vital to what God does. When you have commitment in a church, commitment brings strength, it brings health. COVID, 2020, what a weird time that was. Do you remember when you were rich if you had a lot of toilet paper? Remember that? <laughs> what a weird time COVID was. COVID devastated churches. There were laws, and we're trying to work out what's happened. There were churches that shut for a time. I don't remember how many weeks uh, we were shut here. But there were churches that shut down because of the laws or because they were afraid or because they didn't know what was going on. Do you know all across America, there were churches that never survived COVID? When men ask me now, I'm looking for a building, I say, what you need to do is you need to search for a church that didn't survive COVID. Because it's very common... They're all shut down, they're live streaming. And then the pastor said, okay, the church is open. There were churches that the people never came back. Why? Because they weren't committed in the first place. And the moment you broke the chain, there are people out of habit go to church. The moment that was all across America, there were churches, they, they closed their doors because the people were not committed. That was not true in our church is by and large, most of the people, as soon as the doors were open or as soon as they worked out their health issues or whatever, our congregation and most congregations across the fellowship, people returned because they were committed. There was strength. The economic crash of 2008, remember that? The stock market crash, property crash, uh, uh, money crisis was going on. Many churches suffered in the economic crash of 2008. Some of you told me, I work with so-and-so from the church across the street or this one or that one. And, uh, and they were telling them, you know what, our church were hurting financially, so they had to shut ministries, lay off staff, pastors. They had. Do you know that in the economic crisis of 2008, our income did not go down, our income went up? because we have committed people. I think there are people, they saw that, they heard this and they said, you know what? I wanna make sure my church survives. And so they're giving, that brings strength and that brings health. This is true for most of the, uh, the churches in our fellowship. Our churches are built on commitment and that's where commitment came from. Let's talk secondly about milestone ministry. In the early days of our church, my parents came in 1970. Our church benefited from outside ministry, from evangelists. An evangelist is someone who preaches, 
but not in their home church. They travel. They are itinerant. That means traveling. Traveling ministers. We had John Metzler, Larry Reed, Bob French. They were the most common, but there were many, many evangelists. We have some flyers from the early days here. This is John Metzler. He would have been the most common one. He was the original person we had come uh, uh, preach and uh, did a fantastic job. Very, very helpful. Uh, next picture, I think, oh, this is John Metzler preaching. He was a snappy, that's the 70s, baby. He was a snappy dresser. I still remember as a boy seeing John with those gold rings that he'd wear. He played the drums on the steering wheel. I still remember that. And then Larry Reed was another one. Uh, Larry Reed here, come and groove to the ultimate eternal trip. That was the 70s. But Larry Reed, we had him again and again and again. Very powerful ministry, Bob French. So we had a lot of revivals. When, you, when revival breaks out, as far as people flooding in and getting saved, you have revival meetings. They can be a powerful part of that. We had a lot of evangelists, a lot of visiting preachers, but of necessity, almost all of them were outside. All of them were outside of our church, certainly, but many of them were even outside of our fellowship. Okay, Dad knew John Metzler. He went to Bible school with him. So he knew him personally. He knew of him. He knew Dick Mills, who was a Foursquare evangelist originally. He had him preach a number of times. I, I talked about him in the early days. I have shown a number of times uh, uh, my dad's Bible words that he got from him. He knew the Westbergs, who were husband and wife evangelistic team from Foursquare. But we had, we needed revivals so much everybody else outside of those few dad was taking a chance someone would recommend hey you know Bubba Smith he evangelizes or whatever the name would be um, that's made up obviously but so someone would recommend or you'd have people who call I'm Bubba Smith and I have evangelistic ministry and so Dad would take a chance. He wanted, he believed, he's Pentecostal, he wanted evangelistic ministry, but he also wanted to protect the church. So how do you protect the church when there are guys that you don't know? Any of you that were here in the very early days, you know what Pastor Mitchell did? He would announce the pastor, he would, uh, the visiting speaker, he would preach, and Dad would go sit on the stage, which was very tiny, right? The pulpit's here, the piano's there. Dad would sit at the piano while the guy was preaching. There were two reasons for this. Number one is if the guy, he had no idea what some of these people were going to say because he didn't know them. If they, in a worst case scenario, he only had 15 steps to grab the microphone, right? That, that was number one. But the second thing, any of you from the early days would remember this, is we'd have a guy and he would start saying something crazy and you would hear from behind the piano, Pastor Mitchell speaking in tongues. Shundo lo bo bo bo. And that was a signal. Everybody who heard Pastor Mitchell speaking in tongues during the sermon, something's not right here. And that was a way of uh, uh, protecting. On a few extreme occasions, I remember at least two times, he would have a guy that he didn't know and the guy was nuts. Whatever he was doing, he either was not very good or there were some that just said kooky things. Pastor Mitchell would meet them during the day and say, this isn't working. He would do the right thing by them, pay all of their expenses, give them a full week's uh, love offering, uh, ministry to support his family, but he would say, this isn't going to work. You're going to go away. And uh, on a few occasions, I remember he would get somebody else to finish the revival. So needing evangelistic ministry, there were some inherent problems. So these people you don't know, many of them were independent. They didn't really belong to a church. To this day, if you ever see someone and they say, it's Bubba Smith Ministries, it's the person's name and a ministry, they probably don't belong to a local church. They're totally independent. Someone who is independent is not accountable. How are they living? What is their character? Who knows? Because they don't belong to a church that doesn't help people 
spiritually if they're not accountable. And then the other problem was for evangelists during those days, they're preaching for love offerings or for donations. And the problem is many churches are not generous. So if you are preaching in churches and they are miserly with their expenses or, or even their love offerings, what that would produce is you had evangelists, they tended to be selling things. They would want to come to preach, but they wanted to sell all kinds of things, books, uh, uh, you know, pictures of the Holy Land, it didn't matter what it was, because they're trying to make a living. And, uh, and so then what happens is people who are desperate for money, many of these unaccountable, not a part of a church, needing money, they often became financial scammers. They were manipulating while they're there, I told you, of an evangelist that was uh, very frequent in the early days and we discovered in our first rebellion that he was speaking to people and getting them to tithe, send their tithe to, to him personally. So you had scammers, manipulation. And then the third thing for evangelists was out of financial necessity. If you are preaching in small churches and they don't give uh, much money to survive financially, evangelists had to be gone all the time. That is not good for your marriage, that's not good for your family, your children. Dad believed in evangelistic ministry. He had been blessed, I, I showed you words that he was given by Dick Mills, powerful gift ministry. Dad believed in it. He wanted there to be evangelists in our fellowship, but he wanted them to be healthy. He didn't want every new church to have to go through what he did and have the crazy scammers and the nut jobs coming through. He said, what we need is we need evangelists from within. We need evangelists, we know them. We know what they believe. We, we know that they have a pastor. We know they're accountable, uh, all these kinds of things. And then secondly, dad had a heart. Not only did he want churches to be able to have healthy evangelistic ministry, he had a heart for evangelists and their families. He wanted them to be taken care of. When we started having revivals and men preaching, dad started putting in guidelines. If you're gonna have an evangelist, you are going to pay their travel expenses. It's not right. You want them to come, it costs them money to get there, then the, the, the church they're preaching for should pay the expenses. Put them in a decent hotel. Don't let them stay in a house with 17 kids and four feral dogs. Don't, no, that's not right. And definitely no cats, that's out of the... Uh, uh, I'll move on before I get hit here, okay. <laughs> And then he uh, makes sure you feed them and meet their needs. And he had guidelines. You, you're going to pay them decently so that it was to help the family, but it was also to help they don't need to scam people because we are taking care of evangelists. And he wanted, especially, dad had a heart, he wanted evangelist marriage and their family to survive. And so he said, the only way that's going to work is if we have evangelists from within. And so I remember as a boy in, in a conference, in a Prescott conference, as part of our announcements, one night Pastor Mitchell preached on the evangelistic ministry, and he announced for the first time an evangelist that would be from our fellowship. We have a, a picture here, and that was Harry Hills. He was the very first fellowship evangelist that we had uh, Harry and the perm. I don't know how that worked for him, but the next one is uh, Harry. This was Harry Hills. Harry had a very powerful uh, gift ministry. I must say, looking through photos, there are people that are no longer with us, and some of them, I'm okay with that. I don't miss them. I actually miss Harry. I wish he made better uh, choices in life, but nonetheless, he had a very powerful gift ministry, extremely accurate People got healed, people got saved, he was a blessing. So he was the first time. And with this, dad said for all future evangelists, Harry was the first and then we got more, dad put in a structure. Evangelists are only gonna go out for two weeks at a time away from their wife and kids and then they'll be home 
for a full week. One, so they can hear preaching. They need to be fed. Two, for their marriage. Three, for their kids. And then Dad instituted our evangelists when they're on the off week. We will pay their salary so that they don't have to be scammers and so that their needs are met. That was a milestone. And from there, I would say around the fellowship, we have more than 3,400 churches right now, and we probably have 200 evangelists, I would say, all around the world in different nations because we believe in evangelistic ministry. Okay, final uh, thing we're going to look at today is we're going to look at male leadership. I want to show you some pictures here. My parents were saved in 1953 at the first Foursquare Church uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. These ladies were his pastors. On the left, Louise Webster. She was not only the pastor of the church, she was the supervisor of all Foursquare churches in Arizona at that time. There weren't many, but she was the leader and the other pastor was Reverend Mary Jane May. A uh, little trivia that I've been telling you all along. Louise Webster on the left, that is Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel. Chuck Smith was originally a Foursquare pastor. And that is his sister-in-law. Kay Smith was Kay Webster. And uh, that was just a little bit of trivia that you see. So, Dad was saved in the Foursquare Gospel Church, was founded by a woman... Amy Semple McPherson, and these were his two pastors. My dad was always grateful to these ladies uh, in their ministry. Uh, someone told me during conference or reminded me of this. In later years, dad did, long after Louise Webster had retired, uh, he did a healing crusade in Phoenix, Arizona, or Glendale, down in the valley, and Sister Webster came, and my dad, because he respected and appreciated her ministry, he had her stand, publicly honored her, because that was dad. He was respectful, and he appreciated uh, ministry. Okay, you can take those down. But over time now, my dad studied the Bible. Over time... Dad, as he studied the Bible, he came to the conclusion that biblically, leadership is male. In other words, female pastors are not biblical. And I'm not going to go into super detail. Four foundations of this. Number one, you have the Genesis pattern. The book of Genesis, Genesis means beginnings. It's the starting point. And Genesis forms patterns that are meant to be forever. You learn about sin, blood sacrifice, covenant, worldwide impact. There are things in the book of Genesis, they will never stop. They are forever. In the book of Genesis, even talks about things that never stop. In the book of Genesis, we see in the garden, we see God's plan, leadership was Male, he put Adam in charge. And Adam as a man being in charge was not like, woman, who's in charge? The man is. It actually is a responsibility that is greater. Remember, Adam and Eve both sin. And when God shows up, what does he say? Adam, where are you? She ate first. Don't care. Where are you? because I put you in charge. So you have Genesis, that's the first foundation of male leadership. Secondly, you have the Old Testament pattern. The Old Testament pattern, priests, prophets, kings, they were all men. Biologically men, not just identifying as men. <laughs> we live in a weird world, I have to specify that <laughs> these days, but God is again showing the pattern. Thirdly, Third foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God wants, 
Look at Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, when he was on the earth, he chose 12 disciples that he might have them be apostles or a sent one. How many of them were women? Zero. Because this is a pattern of what God intends. What's fascinating to me is you can have Christians, they say, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, amen, brother. Jesus Christ shows us what God is like. That's right. They, they like that. God came to save sinners. The Son of Man didn't come to seek and save, but that which is like. Yeah, that's right. And then you point out, okay, if you agree with that, and the disciples were men. Well, uh, yeah, that's just because uh, the culture at the time. So Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, he didn't know the pattern he was setting? Well, you got to understand, that was just the Jew. He could have picked a more enlightened era, right? But he chose to be born in Israel at that time. Leadership was male. And then we finally have Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. Paul, who had encounters with God, caught up to the third heaven, literally saw heaven uh, in that way. And one of the things... Much of what we know the church is supposed to be, we know it from the Apostle Paul in his writings, and we see his word on leadership, 1 Timothy 2.12. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Okay. That is written, the book of Timothy, he's telling a young pastor how to order the church. There are many spiritual gifts, discipleship, many different things are involved there. And here he says, that is, he's getting this from the Holy Spirit, is women are not supposed to teach. And of course, this does not include teaching women or teaching children in Sunday school. But he says in church, this is pastoring. They are not to teach or have authority over a, a man. So, these are the biblical foundations my father started coming to, having been saved in a denomination, founded by a woman, having woman pastors. But he said, but you can't get away from the Bible. And the Bible says leadership is supposed to be male. Now, here's the problem. Our problem is we apply human preference to the work of God or to the church. We, we apply current values. Well, I, I'm quite certain some of you are thinking, how outdated is that? We think that preference and current values are above the word of God. It's very common today, we want to make this a value issue. If you say women are not supposed to be pastors, then you have women or people who will automatically say, then you must hate women. You're misogynistic. Or you think that women are stupid or you think women are worth less than men. It's not a value issue. Listen, there are women in church right now that I pastor, you are probably more intelligent than I am. It's not, a, it's not an intelligence issue. It is not a, a quality of a, a, a person that a man is better. Personally, my wife is a better human being, in my opinion, than I am. But she's not called. It's not intelligence, it's not, it's not the, the uh, uh, worth issue, it is a calling and a function issue. So the mistake that we make today, it's, a, it's an old one, is we prefer, right? In our world, I prefer, we have people, I prefer that men can identify as a woman. That's madness. I don't care if you prefer it, it's not true. And you want to go against God's word. Now, I know the scriptures that are commonly used. What about Deborah? Deborah is the patron saint of everybody who wants women pastors. <laughs> Deborah, powerfully used by God. But Deborah, and Barak came and said, I want you to help lead. She told him, I'm not supposed to. You're supposed to. Now, she said, I will, because this is always the case. If men won't lead... Women will. That's true in the home. If a man won't lead in the home, the wife will take over. 
That's true in the church. But Deborah said, I will, but you're going to lose honor because that was not God's intention. Then Galatians 3.28 is often quoted, for in Christ there is neither male nor female, uh, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, um, uh, but we're all one in Christ. But that scripture is not talking about pastoring. That's often quoted. See, there's neither male nor female, so anybody can be a pastor. But Galatians is written to talk about salvation. Galatians was written coming against the law, Judaism. In Judaism, in the temple, access to God was limited. Only Jews could come so far. Then if you're a woman, you could come a little farther than a non-Jew, but you were blocked. You could never enter the presence of God. Men could come farther than Levites, then the high priest, on and on and on. Galatians is written saying, in salvation, there is neither male nor female. There is no difference. Every person, male, man, woman, or child, you can have access to God. That's a salvation issue. That's not a preaching issue. And it's important that you understand that, uh, that distinction. It's not a worth issue. I am not worth more than people who are not pastors. Because in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. That's a value and access. You that's why I say you read your Bible. Don't ask me to read the Bible for you. You read it. You pray. Because I'm not closer to God because I'm a pastor. However, biblically, leadership is male. And this is very, very important that we uh, understand this. Then, of course, the great problem you have, but Pastor Mitchell was saved with women pastors. Yes, he was. And he always appreciated them. You can never make usage be higher than the word of God. The Bible says a woman named Rahab, who was a prostitute, was used by God. Is there anybody here that you are arguing that prostitution is a necessary ministry requirement? <laughs> no, because we understand prostitution is wrong. That's an anomaly, right? That's an outlier, okay? No one else? Fine, Rahab, we don't care what you are. You want to do right? But we do not make usage. Samson cavorted with hookers, but was used by God. But we don't see in the book of Timothy, ministry requirements, husband and one wife, and you must cavort with hookers. Because usage does not trump God's word. God's word, I gave you just four foundations, leadership is male. This is important in our fellowship because our calling, biblically, our calling as a church is discipleship. And this is very, very important because Male leadership works out in the church. Very interesting book. I, I recommend you can read Why Men Hate Going to Church. Uh, the guy's name is Moreau, if I remember right. M-U-R-O-W. Off the top of my head, I'm pulling that out of the air. But he takes note that in Christian churches as a whole, in the average church, most churches would be 60% women and higher. You have churches that are 70%, 80%. I've had friends through the years, they say, I went to church as a kid, and there were like two men in the whole church. Because female pastors or female leadership, it works out in, uh, in the congregation. But now we're talking about discipleship. This is just human nature in any human group, uh, when, when women are added, men change. And often not, a, men act like dorks when women get around. Um, do you, are you aware of that? Remember, boys, uh, some of you, you're 59, you're still a dork, but that's a different issue. Okay. <laughs> so we're called to make disciples. And so the issue becomes, in an atmosphere of female leadership, you can't make disciples. They cannot uh, rise uh, to this. So one of the common things is men will never admit they have a need in front of a woman. Right? That's why the man will never look at a map. 
I think you're going, nope. Okay. So my father came to the conclusion, there finally came a point in our history where he began to preach openly and let it be known, I do not agree with women pastors. Okay, that's unbiblical. We have never in our fellowship had female pastors from the time my father came in 1970, and we will never have. We, in a couple months, we will hit 3,500 churches around the world in probably 145 nations of the world. 100% of them are men. Okay. This now created tension. I began to tell you last week, we started with Foursquare. Why are we not a part of the Foursquare church today? I told you tension number one, dad began to say Bible schools are unbiblical. We're going to train men in-house. We're not going to send them to school. And then when they began to succeed, that was tension number one. That caused problems. Tension number two is territorial. And that was that as we planted churches and a man, he felt he was in charge of an area. He resented that we planted. He resented they were doing well. He resented. So this caused people to start to fight against Pastor Mitchell and, and our fellowship. Tension number three, this one is huge. When dad, in an organization founded by a woman with female pastors, and the leadership often was female, when Pastor Mitchell said, Female pastors are not biblical. A target was put on him. They did not appreciate, they did not say, well, thank you for sharing that, Wayman, from the, God's word. This is emotional, right? This is like you telling a Catholic, you know, the Virgin Mary didn't stay a virgin. You try that with a Catholic friend. See how that, well that goes over. So this, I mean, caused major problems from the time that my father let it be known that he did not agree with female pastors the clock was ticking we were not going to be able to survive because they're not going to put up with that and this is emotional in many different ways I was saved under a woman you don't have to come and tell me afterwards I had a great woman pastor or or I knew a church and it worked great I'm not trying to sort out the church world I'm just telling you what we're doing in our church and our our uh, fellowship. Interesting, during this time, Glenn and Donna Cluck, they were pastoring uh, a, a native church among the Hualapai tribe in Peach Springs, Arizona. We've got a picture of Glenn and Donna here. Here they are, Peach Springs, a young Glenn and Donna Cluck. They're laboring for the Lord there. They were restless. They wanted to make a change, and they had to... Uh, Give, been given access to this place through a four-square woman, and uh, she was the kind of a supervisor in the area. Glenn talked to her and began to say that he was uh, restless, not satisfied, and she warned him, whatever you do, don't go to Prescott. You stay away from Wayman Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, revivals break out. People are getting saved. Who wouldn't want people to get saved? But she was a female pastor, and Pastor Wayman Mitchell had said he didn't agree with female pastors. So she said, don't go to Prescott. But they came to Prescott. <laughs> came to a Prescott conference and were stirred by what they saw. Met with Pastor Mitchell, I believe it was Saturday morning after the conference, and telling them what they were trying to do. They had no financial support. Pastor Mitchell said, how can I help you? And if I remember, he sent them away with uh, some money and uh, some practical help for their ministry. We thank God for them. Glenn and Donna pastored numbers of churches, did powerful works for us in there. I think we have one more picture of a young Glenn and Donna Cluck here laboring for the Lord. But this is foundational to who we are as I say, in a few months, we'll hit 3,500 churches, and they're all from within local congregations. 100% of them, we are a male-led fellowship. And I'm, I want to be honest with you, if you're visiting from another church, if you really want female pastors, you're probably not going to like it here, and I'm being upfront with you. 
We've had a few ladies through the years, they've been praying that the Lord would reveal the error of our ways and make us change our mind. They wasted their time and their breath. It's never going to happen. We even had a few that the Lord revealed to them, supposedly that they were going to be the first female pastor. That's delusional. That is never going to happen because this is foundational to who we are. And this is true across our fellowship. We're going to stop there and the service will start at 1030. God bless you.